Afternoon everybody, my name's Ian File. Uh, I'm from the Simeon Risk Group, the Ops Director, and I'm going to talk to you today about the Milton Keynes collapse and what we need to learn and uh, basically, have we learnt anything? Because in simple terms, this happened in 2006, why are we still talking about it today in 2012? Because there are things we haven't learned. Our scaffold still falling over? Yes. So, if I can master this didgeridoo, we're in business. So, okay, the overview of what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about the Milton Keynes collapse, for starters, the consequences of why it happened, why do scaffolds collapse, what lessons we've learnt, and we'll have some summary and questions and just to let you know this is based on information provided by the HSE. My business partner Simon Hughes did an expert report on behalf of the solicitors and also it was taken up by the HSE for this collapse so we've got quite a bit of information, a bit of insider information as well. This is the picture of the collapse, this happened in Milton Keynes in the first 11th of April 2006 and as you can see one side of the building has come down and it's peeled around the return onto sort of like that pile of scaffolding. <clears throat> the crane that's in place probably did it a favour because it stopped the momentum of it going any further. On the 11th of April as we said a substantial collapse at the new Jury's Inn it affected the west elevation and part of the north and south elevations. The west elevation was approximately 40 metres high and 16 metres long. There were 20 minor injuries recorded, three Riddor major injuries, one fatality as a result on the 14th of April and the photograph in there is the gentleman, who, John Robinson, who sadly died of his injuries. Now, it's a well-talked about, a well-publicised topic, this. And as I've said to you before, we still have scaffolding falling. We still have scaffolding falling over as of today. There were no design for the scaffolding inclusive of the loading bay. So a 40 metre high scaffold, no design? Doesn't bear thinking about, does it? The south elevation had been dismantled in the middle of March and only a small return had been left one bay. Does everybody understand when I talk about a return? This is an elevation of scaffolding going that way and it returns round sort of the corner of the building. So there'd only been a small return. There were insufficient ties and the ties were installed by a trainee scaffolder. So you can see the pattern developing, can't you? Who's, if you're all working with scaffolding today and tomorrow, who's putting the ties in at the end of the day? Is there enough? I got a call last week off a solicitor who said to me, we've had a put log scaffold fall over. We think there's eight ties in it. It's eight meters high and it's 40 meters long. Do you think there's enough? I said, just on the law of averages, I don't. But it's insufficient, as we can say. There was no tie testing carried out. Now, there was no masonry anchor test available. We can only say that because there's none available, there's been none, taken, none carried out. Ties were not installed properly. Now, that is the HSE's comments on that. So. You look, at, you look at the press tomorrow and it may say scaffold has fallen over in the high wind. It's quite a frustrating thing for people like me who's an ex-scaffolder and now a safety consultant to know that the high wind has blown the scaffold over. Because at the end of the day, a scaffold should be built to take the 100, what we call the 100 mile an hour wind or the 100 year wind. And design is always designed to that factor as well. So if a scaffold's built correctly with the ties in, it should never go. This scaffold was debris netted and it also included an advertising banner. 
as you can see on the photograph. So instantly we've got no design, we're 40 metres high, we're now putting some debris netting on it. So we've got a wind problem, haven't we? If the wind's up, the wind's blowing on the debris netting. It's not as sort of like transparent as the scaffold used to be. As soon as we put an advertising banner on it as well, we're creating a cracking wind load, aren't we? Because your advertising banner isn't just a two meter by two meter on the working lift. It's across maybe two, three lifts. The scaffolding contractor who won the job sublet the job to a labor only contractor. So what can go wrong is going wrong, isn't it? You know, what, what's, you know if, if you could do an accident investigation training course and say, I'm going to create a scenario, everything that I'm talking to you about now is falling into place, isn't it? Isn't it? You know what I'm saying? So they sublet that to a labor only. The labor only people were on, the, on a price. There were no specification either in the letter invitation. So what was going to be built, there wasn't a, a real good detailed specification, and then the subcontractor subletting it gave no specification. Just go to the site, build the scaffold. You know. There were a loading bay that was erected to the 16th lift for the cladding materials to be stored on. The day before the collapse, the loading bay was dismantled and anything that was left on that loading bay were transferred onto two bays of scaffolding weighing 2.8 tonnes. So we've now got an overloading issue, haven't we? We've got no design, we've got insufficient ties, the ties have not been put in properly, we've now decided to put some nets and banners on it and then we've decided to overload it. So again, we're on our way to the crescendo. Scaffolders took the loading bay down and stored materials on the scaffold as well. So as they were dismantling the loading bay, rather than take the material back down to the ground, they were passing it onto the lifts as they went down. Which normally what scaffolders do, but we've just added another 2.64 tonne of weight onto the scaffold, on with the 2.8, on with the nets and the poor ties. The scaffold was grossly overloaded. These are all the reports from the HSC, these are not. And it ends up in a pile like the picture on the right. And you can see the picture of all the ambulances in place on the time. News reported that the collapse was possibly due to high winds. I remember Sky News flying over it with a helicopter, the radio on the phone to our office asking us for a report. The television asking my business partner Simon for comments and it was saying that the scaffold was possibly due to high winds. The tower cranes were still operating because they don't wind them off until the 50 kilometers an hour. So if the high winds was up, why were the cranes still going? Bedford Met Meteorological Office reported an average wind speed of 26 knots at 40 meters per second. So 26 knots, 28 mile an hour basically, isn't it? 29 mile an hour. The statutory inspections of the scaffold, so when we were doing the inspections weekly, were not completed. The regime had lapsed. Now the reason why behind that was there was a safety advisor, the main contractor, doing the scaffold inspections, who had a two day scaffold inspection course. Now, we're inspecting something 40 metres high. The scaffolding should have had, as a minimum, double standards at the bottom, which it didn't have. So they don't even teach you that on a basic scaffold inspection course. So it's horses for courses, isn't it? It's a, it's a big job. You'd be looking to have a competent, qualified guy to work on that, doing the inspections. And you'd expect them to be done every week as well. There was mixed materials, there was galvanised scaffolding tube and there was also a mix of what we call the black steel which is not galvanised, which eventually becomes what we call ginger steel because it rusts 
and it sort of gets thinner. So it's not as strong as galvanized tube. So a mixture of them components, overloading, the stresses are all there to, for everyone to see. So to bring it back into consequences, aside from the loss of life and personal injuries, the massive disruption and associated delays with the work, the coroner's verdict of the death of John Robinson, the principal contractor was fined 90,000 and 42,000 costs. The cladding contractor was fined 36,000 and 28 costs. What do you think the scaffolding company was fined? Anybody a hazard a guess? Nothing. Any particular reason? No, they were looking for the scaffolding contractor, but they'd gone bump. So there was nothing to chase. You know, that's the problem. They uh, called it a day, you see. But there was a warrant out for the managing director of the scaffolding company, which we're not sure if he's still around, still alive, or maybe in Spain. That's literally. So if he swipes his passport, any of the airports, I think there's a, a warrant out for him somewhere down the line. There was two business partners. I'm under, I'm under the impression that one of them's now not with us, but the other one's still on the run somewhere so there will be civil claims for damages one day that may come out that you know but if somebody's lost a life and there's been 20 injuries and the delay costs and everything like that you can only put a price of somewhere between five to ten million on the insurance claim for that job as well won't you so why do scaffolds collapse i think i'll give you quite a few examples as we've been talking in the past few minutes, but simply poor design or lack of design. Now, what I will tell you is, we've had the forum this morning with CDM and things like that, and do scaffolds, do scaffolders design? Well, yes, they do, because if it's a basic job, they design it in line with a booklet called TG20. So the simple things is, the scaffolders will put basic scaffolds up under their own steam. So literally, they will design. So don't always think, because there isn't a sheet of paper there with some calculations, it's not designed. It is in a way. Poor construction. So, competence of the scaffolders you've got on site. Competence of the supervision. Competence of the person who is actually the scaffold designer. All these things come into the managing of contractors. Inadequate ties or the substructure, what they tie the ties into. Two scaffold tubes, two scaffold fittings inside of a window reveal, packed up with a bit of wood, is not what I would call a sufficient tie. So we've got to be looking at the right type of ties in the right type of places. Undermining or subsidence. I did a job in Lime Street in Liverpool. I came to inspect it the week later. There were 14 lifts of cup lock on a set of student flats and someone had dug a hole underneath the scaffolding because they wanted to lay a drain. So we managed to get some beams put in against the building to stop the scaffolding wanting to come down and lean in like that. There was a collapse on the, on the go there. Again, site managers not talking to site managers. So again, it's all down to inspection again. No matter who builds it, the man down. Because you know in your own mind, if a scaffold falls over and that's your company, the first thing the gaffers will say, who built it? Who inspected it? And then the third thing will be, is anybody hurt? You know, because it's self-preservation, isn't it? So, you, you know, let's not beat around. Adverse weather, high winds. If a scaffold's built to design you know, alongside TG20, or it's built with an engineer's drawing, tied correctly, it will stand basically any weather unless we get a tornado or a what we call an act of god hurricane that might take the building as well as the scaffolding <clears throat> overloading make sure what we put on the scaffold again is evenly distributed you know what the loadings are if it's general purpose it's normally two kilonewtons per square meter so what we work on there is 200 kilos per square meter so a general purpose bay will probably take about 460 kilos 
always remember the strongest part of any bay is where the legs are never in the middle so if we load the middle and we get a set of gondolas as we go along we know someone's been overloading it interference another problem people taking things out of scaffolding management of scaffolding I build you a scaffold today I hand it over to you you sign it for me I leave for six months while you work on a job and something goes wrong with that scaffold after three could somebody have taken something out of it because that's going to be my defense isn't it I'm gonna say you're in charge of it you're inspecting it I left you a perfectly good scaffold or maybe a combination and I think that's what the combination and the problems that we've had with Milton Keynes. So, there was a HSC statement in 2006, 2008 and 2010. And if you go scaffolding information sheet on the HSC website, you'll be able to download that straight away. And it says it alerts people to those working on similar projects to the importance of their arrangements to provide and maintain stable scaffolds and the arrangements are reviewed regular reviews take accounts of factors which include but are not limited to part of the areas what I spoke to you before which was scaffold design securing scaffolds to structures loadings on scaffold including wind impact so don't have a normal scaffold and then put some monoflex sheeting on it without checking with somebody you know, because I'm a bit cold, I'll just wrap the sheet round on night shift. You know, a bit of a welder's thing when I was working on the rigs. I'm freezing tonight, get me some tarp. You know, risk of direct impact by construction, plant and vehicles. Because you know if somebody hits your scaffolding with a wagon or a, a truck or anything like that, they're always going to come in the office and hold their hand up and say, I've hit your scaffold, haven't they? You're only going to find that during the uh, seven day inspection when you've got a load of bent standards. <clears throat> Frequency and thoroughness of scaffold inspections. Remember, if someone's knocking on your door at five past eight on the cabin door of the site, saying, can you sign this because I've done the inspections, does it really look like he's been round and had a look? You know, there are a lot of drive-by inspectors, so you've got to watch what's going on. Systems for handover of new and adapted scaffolds, so just keep that in mind. And competence of scaffolders. Are the guys on the job trained? and adequacy of the foundations remember what you put in it on has an impact when you build it remember prevention of unauthorized modifications so it's more a management tool okay everybody anybody got any questions on Milton Keynes or scaffolding in general yeah I was quite pleased with the uh, reaction from the audience and uh, to my presentation I never got any questions actually at the end of the presentation but Three to four people came up to me as I was leaving the lectern uh, to discuss areas of the presentation which would be suited more to their company.